Hello and welcome to UCL Global Health. Women and children across the developing world are still dying in very large numbers. The Millennium Development Goals are aiming to see big reductions in deaths of mothers and children by 2015, but many countries are still off track. I'm joined by Richard Horton, who's editor of The Lancet, but who, Richard, you wear another hat. You're co-chair of uh, the Independent Expert Review Group, which is now reporting on progress on mothers and children to the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And you've just re released your first report of the IERG. What were the key findings? Yeah, Joel Murphy and I co-chair this small group that was set up uh, this year to try and provide a way of having independent accountability around where we're doing, where we're going with MDGs 4 and 5. And not surprisingly, the news is mixed. Um, the good news is that uh, you are seeing now, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, remarkable reductions in rates of child mortality, and, and it's much slower, but still down the trends in maternal mortality. Which are the, which are the best? Who, who's doing best at the moment? Well, what you're seeing, the, the best countries are actually uh, middle-income countries rather than low-income countries. So what you're seeing, for example, in China and Egypt is massive, massive falls yeah. in rates of uh, child newborn mortality. And they're going to hit their Millennium Development Goal targets. In some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, you're seeing progress. To take one example that we published on recently in Niger, through a remarkable series of virtuous uh, incidents, fantastic political commitment, really huge scale-up of uh, interventions, you're seeing really quite precipitous falls in mm. child mortality. Or is it just the economy? It's not just the economy. I mean, I think this, this is, a, is a myth, actually, that just growth of the economy on its own is going to reduce maternal and child mortality. You have to have concerted scale up of interventions yeah. to get that right. So we are seeing some successes, but, but the thing that the rates hide, which is really quite scandalous because the UN system just reports rates, if you actually look at the numbers of child deaths and newborn deaths, the story is totally different. And this is the story that's never told. So if you look at at 26 countries, most of which are in Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers of newborn deaths in 2011 is higher than the number of newborn deaths in 1990. So although the rates are falling, the absolute numbers are actually going up. If you look at child mortality in 13 countries, the numbers of under five deaths have gone up from 2011 compared with... Is this HIV? The... No, it's population. So what you're seeing is, you're seeing this toxic combination yeah of risk for children, but also growing population, high fertility rates. So although the rates are going down, mm. the total numbers are going up. Now, my big complaint with the way the UN reports this is they claim this is a fantastic success, mm. the reduction in rates. But if we, really, if we really mean what we say, which is that we value the life of every human being, every child, we should see this as a scandalous failure, not a mm. success that we haven't dealt with one critical part of the equation, which is the issue of reproductive rights. Not just access to contraception, but the whole role of women in our society and rights that women have in terms of political participation, access to services. And that's what's driving so much of our child mortality today. Can I just unpick a couple of things? Firstly, the aid aspect of this, to what extent the wealthy governments of the world are really investing more in mother and child health. And then perhaps we'd come on to look at what national governments are doing and are they really being held accountable. But let's start with the, the, the wealthy side of the equation. Um, governments get up to tricks, don't they? Double accounting for aid budgets, um, saying that they're going to give commitments that then they don't actually do. What's your take on this? Do you think we're investing enough? Do you think people are stepping up to the plate? So double accounting <coughs> is right. So everybody makes these commitments, makes these promises, and when you actually unpick the numbers and look at the detail, probably what you're seeing is only a third of the actual commitments that are being made is, is actually new money. Yeah. So maybe we've got an extra 20 billion in the system than we had, but the claims that it was more like 60 billion are completely untrue. Mm. So there is a problem with reporting. 
But actually, I think even worse than that, because when you, 20 billion is a lot of money to have new money in the system, so that looks good. But if you look, if you track it year by year, what you actually see for the first year in the last decade, you've actually seen a small downturn in the amount of money being injected. Which might not be surprising. Given Which the isn't financial surprising crisis. given the financial crisis, but as we're now moving into the last two or three years towards 2015, the end of the MDG era, what we should be doing is accelerating progress. Yeah. What we're actually seeing is a reversal of investment and commitment into children. Just one interjection. You published some findings from the London School, Anne Mills Group, the, about the amount of money spent by all rich countries on mother and newborn health, leaving aside vaccines. Yeah. And it came to under $1.5 billion, which I worked out was about 10% of the Goldman Sachs bankers' bonus pool in 2011. It's not a vast amount of money, is it? It's not a vast amount of money. And, and the, the amount of labour you have to get to even get that amount of money out of the global system yeah. is crazy. You know, our colleague and friend Zulfi Buto always compares the defence spending in Pakistan with the amount of money that's invested in health. Yeah, I mean, you've right. got David Cameron roving around the Gulf selling the defence industry. I mean... This, Let's not be controversial. I mean, We're on is, it. I mean here you have people <laughs> who are focused on an aspect of our uh, supposed economy which brings death and destruction to women and children. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, if you look at the impact uh, across Africa, for example, in conflict zones, there are about 20 countries that are in the throes of civil war, fueled by a defense industry, um, which is largely driven by countries like the United States and, and in Western Europe, which is leading to huge numbers of deaths for women. Okay, but let's just come on to the countries themselves. And a key element of this accountability commission is to give governments advice about how, well, how you can hold governments more accountable for what they do. And a lot of emerging economies have got a lot of money. I mean, we've just stopped giving aid to India from the UK. Um, are governments doing enough? And if not, how can you hold them be more accountable? Some governments are doing really well. I mean, China, if we just take China as an example, has had a remarkable Minister of Health, Chen Zhu, who's just finished his term um, this month. Uh, and 10 years in the job, he has brought in health reforms that have literally transformed the whole landscape for health. An insurance system that is reducing catastrophic payments for health care, providing scale up of services, really moving the country towards okay. universal health coverage. Fantastic. In sub-Saharan Africa, you get some countries like Nigeria that's doing well, but many countries are not. And, and they're not because often it's not just, as Dan B. Samoya would argue um, in her book, Dead Aid, you've got a lot of corruption in Africa. I think that's just a too simplistic analysis. What you've actually got is a set of circumstances uh, where you have, for example, famines, conflict, uh, natural disasters that mean that governance issues in countries are really, really tough. And Although it's changing, hang on, I mean, Mo Ibrahim would say that, you know, you are getting the spread of democracy. I mean, Malawi's done very well, Ethiopia's doing okay, Rwanda's doing well on its mortality reduction, but Sierra Leone. Like, and we are getting, true. hang on, we're getting, um, you know, in Malawi you've got Joyce Banda, you've got in Liberia, you've got Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. But it's you, always the same countries that are mentioned, isn't it? It's, it is the yeah. Malawis, the Rwandas, the Nigerians of this world. Fantastic. But actually, if you look across, you know, 20, 30 sub Saharan African countries, unfortunately, there are great swathes of countries right. where this doesn't happen. And that, I think, is where... But it's early days. I mean, your commission is going to monitor this year by four year. Four years. We've got four years. And what do you think are the key two or three things that governments and nations themselves should be doing or the, the, the civil society sector should be monitoring? Right, you've put your finger on civil society there, and I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think what, what our task is to look at what are the mechanisms in countries for holding governments accountable, because it's very easy to blame donors but actually you do have to look at natural, national governance systems. Now, how do we do that? I mean, I think this is where the partnership with civil society becomes key. And we've got to learn a lesson from the AIDS movement here. And, and those of us in Women's mm. Children's Health have done a really bad job. We have not looked at the way AIDS mobilised civil society to create the movement that actually invented global health in the first place in the last 20 years. So how do we identify those groups that can, that can do that? But a lot of it comes down to big political issues about, for example, women participating in society. Mm. Uh, 
parliamentary democracy. Mm. And that is really hard in many parts of, in many of these countries that suffer some of the greatest burdens. So your next report is in a year's time, a so year's we'll get you back to see whether you think there's progress. We're going to focus on two things then, um, two missing components of this, adolescence, I think adolescent girls are absolutely critical. You, if you think about the, the kind of global women's and children's health community, we focus on young children, yeah. we focus on women. The group we miss, which is the absolute pivot between the two, are adolescent girls. And secondly, we need to do more to look at countries and what they're doing. So come back in a year. Certainly. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I'm absolutely an optimist. Thank you, Richard.